Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back in our Father's Word? Remember, last lecture, seven seals. If there's any one thing I want you to specifically remember from the seven seals is that the Antichrist appeared in the sixth one. And as we're going through the trumps today, you will note that he's in the sixth trump appearance, that is to say. And if we were to continue on, which we will not in this series, into the vials, he would also come in the sixth vial. Six, six, six. No big deal. All right. The book of Revelation is very simple. Any child can understand it. It means the unveiling. Our Father enjoys using symbology. What does symbology do? Well, it has a, a twofold or more, I, I'm, but we're, we'll only cover two fold. Um, purpose. Number one, it hides from the eyes of those that should not see, but at the same time it is an object lesson where you can actually see the object and the movement of it for God to speak to you in a divine way. Never worry with it. Now we come to the trumps. What is a trump? A trump is an instrument that is used to initiate a move. In other words, when the trumps sound, it's time for action. The seal was simply sealed in your mind, the events that shall come to pass. When you hear the trump, that means it is time to execute the commandment of God that was given for that trump or at that time. That's what the seals are for. So we come now to the trumps. Execute action. We ask a word of wisdom from our Father, chapter 8, verse 3, where we had cut, completed the seals, and let's prepare for the trumps. Chapter 8, the great book of Revelation, verse 3, and it reads, And another angel came and stood at the altar. What altar? The altar of God. Having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense. Now what was this incense? Think about it a moment that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the altar, the golden altar, which was before the throne. We learned that the prayers were bottled up. Do you know that God bottles prayers? Your prayer, that, which is simply saying what? He holds on to them. He cares. Why? He loves you. So. The incense is given as uh, to simulate, inasmuch as God is on a higher plane than we are, that it goes up. Have you seen smoke? It goes up. Our prayers go up to Him in His presence, right to the very altar, which is His throne, His seat, uh, so to speak. All right? And uh, verse 4. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hands. God hears your prayers, all right? Five, and the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. Where did it go? Right from the very altar of God onto the earth. Fires from the altar of God. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. God has ministers of fire. That altar, that fire that comes from the altar goes to the ministers of fire and they deliver that fire. And God is a consuming fire. Hebrews chapter 12, the last verse. You can document the ministers of fire in Psalms 104, leading up to it in 103, the closing verses. Delivering God's Word. Um, naturally, God's Word 
concerning the earthquakes, the famines, the events that you absorbed or should have absorbed from the seals that are part of the events that come to pass that consummate the end of this age before the millennium. Verse 6, And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. In other words, before the angels sound, these events transpire between the giving of the seals. I would caution you to remember in your mind back to chapter 7 where the end was held until those that should be sealed in their forehead, which is to say their brain, should absorb that information. Verse 7, And the first angel sounded, that's a trumpet, it means action, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth, not on heaven, but on the, upon the earth, and a, the third part of trees was burned up, burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. Now, was it cast out on people to harm them? No. No, it wasn't. It was on, in a sense, then, what does it mean? It means that the deception of Satan's lies as he comes in prosperously and peacefully goes against the very nature of God, including trees, grass, uh, and so forth. God is supernatural, meaning more natural than anything, the Creator. And as it is written in the book of Daniel, the peace, peace, peace cry begins at this point. I think you've heard it recent enough that Probably you should know that at least that trump has sounded. Peace, 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 they shall cry, but there shall be no peace. Well, we have peace, we have peace boys over at, right now in Bosnia, yeah, and they're blowing the you know what out of the place too. Yeah, that's peace, real peace, all right? Just had a martyr in this one of the fair cities killed 35 innocent people right there in the street. That's peace, right? Oh, okay. We had three peacekeepers that were over there, and they came home, unfortunately, and our regrets to the family. There is no peace until the Prince of Peace comes. Verse 8, And the second angel sounded, Trump 2, action. And as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and a third part of the sea became blood. You'll remember this was one of the signs that Moses used to convince Pharaoh that he was God's uh, prophet and leader at that time. Again, this is the deception that comes forth. You'll find in the 17th chapter of this great book of Revelation that waters are the people. This was deception cast upon the people. Nine. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. Commerce involved with uh, the creatures of the sea with the people being the waters. You can, again, you can document that in the 17th chapter of Revelation. The sea that the beast rises from are the people of the world. All right? And they're deceived again. Why? He's coming, that white horse rider that we read of in the, in the very first seal, that comes claiming to be Christ, wearing a crown, is a fake. And these are the events that consummate the minds of the people to bring them to that point of deception. Verse 10, and the third angel sounded, trumpet three, again, more action, another benchmark. And there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. Now, you will remember third part of the waters and the fountains of waters. Again, the waters are people. Chapter 17, verse 15 will document that fact that waters are symbolic of people. They flow like a river. We've got over five billion living right now on this earth. And why a third part? 
because a third part of God's children followed Satan in the first earth age. I personally believe that that third is living right now and in this final generation, and that's why we have so many devilish ideas floating around a Sodom and Gomorrah and past that point. What a time to live. It's exciting. You'll remember also that Christ would say, that he said he fell as a lamp. And that's, that's supposed to be a light. Christ is our light. Not this fake. He's got a little old dim wick lamp there and he's coming along saying, I'm your boy. I'm here. And how many people are prepared? He's wearing, a, he's riding an old white nag. Now I don't want to say that because that might deceive somebody. It'll be a beautiful creature. You can rest assured that he will be riding. And you know what the horses of God are in the first place. I speak spiritually. But Jesus would say in Luke chapter 10, I beheld Satan as, a, as lightning fall from heaven onto the earth. Revelation chapter 12 verse 7 says, And Michael cast Satan and his angels out upon the earth. Woe to the earth when he's there. This is, this is the prophecy that will bring that to pass. Verse 11, And the name of the star is called Wormwood. Wormwood, the Greek is bitterness. All right? The name of it is bitterness. Who, do, is that a mystery? Do you know who it is that brings bitterness into this world, especially when people will listen to him? And the third part of the waters, the people, became wormwood. They became bitter. And many men died of the waters, a spiritual death, because they were made bitter. In other words, they were when the spurious Messiah comes to... Uh, tell them he's come to rapture them out, they begin worshiping him, this lamp, rather than the true light. Why? They're biblically illiterate. They don't know any better, and quite frankly, they haven't been taught any better in their so-called houses of God. Spiritual death will abound. But they'll be happy in the flesh, prosperous, peaceful, big daddy on the scene. Verse 12. And the fourth angel sounded, again, the fourth trumpet, action, benchmark, observe. And a third part of the sun was smitten, and a third part of the moon. Can you remember the seal? I hope so. And a third part of the stars, stars being the children of God, as you will read in the 38th chapter of Job. So as a third part of them was darkened, and boy will they be darkened, dim-witted, biblically illiterate, poor little babies, ready to fly. And the third shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. What's it talking about? In other words, when the true Messiah returns, the Sun shall not give its light, nor will the moon reflect the light. So it's, it is um, s simulating the appearance of the true Christ. This is a prophecy that would come to pass when that would happen. And you see here the false God. It appeared to be Christ. It looked like Christ. He was uh, honorable. He was on the white horse. All the prophecies fulfilled. It just one trouble. It's not Christ. It's bitterness. And if you do not study God's Word to understand the chronological order of events that consummate the end of this age, you'll be bitter also, my friend. 13. And I beheld and heard an eagle. In the, in the older manuscripts, instead of, instead of angelus, the word is etos, which means an eagle. It was changed to Angelus. Who took the liberty? Well, I don't know. It was changed. Flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Whoa, 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 three times for emphasis to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpets, three more to blast, 
of the three angels which are yet to sound. Are you going to be familiar with them? Are you familiar enough with, you know, many people say, well, you don't have to worry about the book of Revelations. You're going to be gone. No, you're not. No one leaves until the seventh trump sounds. Any Christian should know that if they're, if they uh, understand anything at all about God's word. It is at the seventh trump that we are gathered back to the living Christ. We're only in the fourth, friend. You're still here. And bitterness is here. And there is no way on God's earth that you will be able to withstand except you have the seal of God, which is to say His truth, in your forehead. Do you? Well, I don't know. This is the way you do it with his word. Chapter 9, verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded, fifth trump, action. And I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. Earth. Revelation 12, 7 will tell you what this was. And to him was given a key of the bottomless pit, which is symbolic of Satan's abode. You know that, the pit, the abyss in the Greek, too. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Again, the, to make it appear that Messiah has appeared, as the prophets have foretold. Three. And there came out of the smoke locust, market, locust, upon the earth. And to them was given power as scorpions of the earth have power. Okay, I, I hope that many of you have not experienced what a locust, I, I mean, a, as a scorpion feels like. But um, it's not a very pleasant thing. A very painful thing. And how painful it's going to be for those that sip of the bitter water. This is the locust of the book of Joel, where on Pentecost Day, when the tongues were spoken, Peter would say, This is that that was spoken of by Joel the prophet when both sons and daughters begin to speak uh, with the presence of the Holy Spirit. Verse 4, and it was commanded them, who is this? The scorpions. It was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth. Whoa, hey, that's what locusts attack, is herbage. The grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only I repeat, but only those men, there's no gender here, people, which have not, I repeat, have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Now, if you ever wanted a reason that you should have the seal of God in your forehead, that's simply to say the message of the seals that is to say, the events that transpire in the seals in your brain from the Word of God, this should be it. This should do it. Because if you don't, in other words, God has told Satan, you can go down there, but don't you dare touch any of my anointed with your deception. Well, in the first place, how could he? If you know that the, the uh, spurious one is coming first, what could ever possess you to worship him? Only an idiot would do that. Because, quite frankly, you would be knocking on the door of the unforgivable sin. But some people think they are so brilliant in God's word that they don't have to fear the negative. You don't have to fear the negative, but you had better be wise enough with the seal of God here, or they will eat you alive, friend. They will take you in and you'll be the main course. They will take over your family. They'll split up your home. I'm just speaking of demonic, negative thoughts that 
Satan and his little ones can bring into your family and sit there and laugh at you poor little Christians that haven't got enough intelligence to realize what's happening. God forbids them to even come close to you if you know the truth. In the first place, it would be dangerous for them to come near a true person of God. Why is that? Well, a true person of God is going to send them back where they came from, and that's death to them. They don't like that, and they run from you. Of course, it is the Christ that has the power. So, not to drift from the subject, the seal of God in your forehead, which is simply to say the Word of God in your forehead, whereby you know and understand the chronological order of events. Verse 5, and to them it was given that they should not kill them. I mean, that's no, they're not, they don't, well, there's going to be millions die. No, God does not give them the right to kill anyone. Those that are ignorant and are ready to fly away, God says, not even them, sh you shall, should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment, was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. Now, when God uses an um, animal or an insect, he has a reason for it. You're supposed to understand, well, how, if they're going to do like the scorpion does, how does the scorpion do? Well, first off, friend, the scorpion has no stomach. This is a little gross, but this is what God wants you to know. This is how Satan, with his lies, attacks people. It'll be like the scorpion. The scorpion comes up to its victim with his little tail and bop. He paralyzes the victim with his sting. And then his little pinchers, much like a crab or something like that would have, grabs the body of the victim and pulls it to his mouth, and he regurgitates his digestive juices into the body of the victim because the scorpion has no stomach and it turns everything in the victim's skin or hide to mush, including his backbone. That's what God wants you to know. Graphic? Well, you bet, but it's a pretty graphic time if you don't have God's truth in your forehead. In other words, his lies are going to turn you to mush at his feet. God is always very good to us. Why five months? Well, he mentioned the locust. The locust uh, term, or that term of the locust life, whether it's a 17 year locust or whatever, is five months. And bless your hearts, it happens between May and September. Now, I'm not trying to throw you off guard, but God placed this here for a reason so that you that did have the seal of God would understand the approximate time of this five-month happening of the great deception when Satan, the spurious one, falls to this earth. God does not allow them to kill his children, but only fill them with their lies and corruption to see if they're good enough a Bible student or a child of God that has been interested enough and loved his father enough that he absorbs his word. Verse 6, And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. God said, you can't kill them. When some of these begin to wake up as to who they're worshiping, They're going to want to die for shame. You don't understand. I was a preacher taught the rapture theory, and I led my whole church to the feet of this first spurious, this first Messiah, and turned my whole church over to Satan, and I'm so ashamed I can't face he that died on the cross for me and them. Look what I've done because of my ignorance in listening to the church system and traditions of men. I've taught the word rapture when it's not even in the word of God, rather than putting the seal of God in their forehead. I want to die. It won't help you, friend. Too late. Sorry, Charlie. Better luck next time. Welcome to Millennium Boot Camp. That's when it begins, soon after. Verse 7. 
that's two pastors, all right, not to, uh, not to a lay person. Verse 7, and the shapes are the likeness. You want to know what they look like? You want to know if they're really locusts? You should know already they're not because God uses symbology. Their likeness and the likeness of the locusts were likened to horses prepared into battle. In other words, they were well organized. Hey, you can read of them in the book of Joel. God even calls them His army. It's the army He tests His people with. And on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold. Not gold, like gold. I mean, they look like the king of kings, their leader did. Just one big thing, he wasn't. And their faces were as the faces of men. Okay, not locusts, my friend, men. Eight. And they had hair as the hair of women. This means they were very gentle. And their teeth were as the teeth of lions. In other words, a lion does not uh, kill or take a victim as the can a canine would by simply cutting off the vascular system. It rips, it tears. In other words, they act so religious as one that has women's hair, a regular little frilly dandy just so sweet and just outgoing that heaven's only nose could tell the difference between the little angel of the devil. All right? I like to do this, all right? I, I hope it wakes you up if you haven't studied God's Word. But he's a rip-roaring, tearing, soul-ripping wretch. Okay? Verse 9. And they had breastplates, as it were, the breastplates of iron. Not a beautiful, you know, a priest has a breastplate, but it has the 12 stones of God within it. Even Satan himself, as he was mentioned in the 28th chapter of Ezekiel, had the stones in his breastplate. Not these dudes. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. If you the horses of God and the chariots of God, I have a work on that, and if you're not able to handle the Hebrew, you should order the tape. I'm not trying to push it. Just know what these chariots are. Verse 10, And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months, turn them to mush. Turn them to mush. Now, something real simple. Don't wrestle with it. Verse 11. And they had a king over them. How many guesses would you need? This would, this would make a good quiz for old, uh, one of, question for old Dennis's quiz. Who is the king over the locust army? I wonder how many would miss that. Boy, don't let me know if you did. All right. You better know who the king is of the locust army, which is the angel of the bottomless pit. Hey, there's only one. There's only one angel or supernatural cherubim of the bottomless pit. That's Satan, and you know that, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon. Do you know what that means? Destroyer. There's only one destroyer, one ti man titled that. And the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon, which is one of the primes of Satan's name. Satan himself, none other. Don't ever let anyone deceive you on that point and the simplicity of it. The 17th chapter, I've referred to it several times, it will document that. Verse 12, one woe, remember there were three woe trumps. Before the three woe trumps, everything that happened was to nature itself. Men were not to be stung, Men were left out of it. I mean, it's one of those things that slips up on you like deception always does. But beginning with the first woe trump, the sting was to the victim that was ignorant of God's Word, meaning ignorant concerning the chronological order of events with the spurious Messiah coming first to deceive and the true Messiah coming at the seventh trump to gather us back to Him. Lot gonna happen before we gather back to Christ. 
That's what the gospel armor is for, is this battle. With it on and in place, you don't have anything to worry about. What was the gospel armor for? It states in the sixth chapter of Ephesians, have you not read it? You put it on for one purpose, to stand against the fiery darts of Satan. He'll be here flinging them too. Okay, one woe is past, and there come two woes more hereafter. And the sixth angel sounded. This is the trump in which Satan appears, de facto, as it leads to it, when he's here for action. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice uh, from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. Those horns are symbolic of the power of God. So you shouldn't worry. Anytime the power of God is present, you should take a sigh of relief. God's in control. You don't have to worry about these critters. They can't bother you. You have been injected with a shot that brings about immunity to you from anything Satan can do as long as you use that that was, um, that was injected, which is to say your brain, where you think for yourself. 14. This is the word from the four horns, the very altar of God, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. The Euphrates has always been the boundary between uh, Babylon and God's people, the king of Babylon and the Lord of Lords. 15. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for, listen carefully, an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men, third part of God's children that worship Satan in the first earth age and all others that are ignorant concerning God's word or probably a nicer word, biblically illiterate. Let me help you with this 15th verse. Anytime you have these four things under one article, uh, that is to say hour, day, month, or year, it means one instant, one split second, one nanosecond. In other words, God knows when that instant is, and it's going to happen. That, my friend, is the sixth trump. There is an instant and a time set that Satan will be released. Scorpions crawling all over, but they're people. Preachers, if you would. I mean, really priest of this new Messiah. Little old disciples just chip chop all over the place. Do you love our Jesus? You'll be saying, well, do you? I don't know. Let me give you just a, you won't have this on your character generator. Let me just give you a little uh, word of encouragement here from God's Word. It is written in Luke chapter 10. I referred to it earlier. And he said unto them, Christ speaking, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Verse 19, when Satan falls from heaven as lightning, do you know what he followed that with? Behold, I give unto you do you know what the power from those horns of the altar were to you? I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, all of them, including Satan, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. How can you go wrong with a deal like that? Why would you be afraid? Why would you be worried about something? That's when you need the two before taken to you. If, you. if you would worry in this generation with the promises God has given you, you're unfit. So be careful about your worry. We have the victory. Naturally, when you have these seals in your mind, then you know of a certainty you're not going to be deceived. Why? He can't deceive you. He's coming first. I think you can count one, two. 
It's that simple. And as long as you're in a flesh body, the true Christ hasn't returned. Remember that. Because at the seventh trump, as it is written in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, at the last trump, in the Greek it is the farthest one out. That's the seventh, which we're about to go to. Then and then only shall these flesh bodies be changed into that spiritual body at the sound of the trump. This hadn't happened yet, friend. You know why? The seventh trump hasn't sounded. But my preacher told me, be careful, friend. It had better be the word of God told me. Okay, let's get to the seventh trump. We're going to take the tenth chapter, and I'm getting short on time. I'm going to close this out pretty quick. Verse 7 of the tenth chapter. Let's go with it. It's pretty well self-explanatory. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. End. Kaput. Over. And he hath declared to his servants the prophets. He's told everything through the prophets. The question is, my friend, have you read it? You should know. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. This is prior to the sounding of the seventh trump. It applies to now. Nine. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up and it shall, be, it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. The word of God always is. But teaching it boldly sometimes draws bitterness, but that's okay. A man of God can handle it. A woman of God can handle it. A child of God can handle it. Ten. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, what happens when you absorb a book? All right, And it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And when you see what Satan is doing to our brothers and sisters, the very children of God, it does make you bitter at Satan, at his angels, and at the ignorance of the so-called uh, shepherds that lead people into blind captivity by a spurious Messiah. Verse 11, And he said unto me, Thou must, I repeat, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. That was prior to the sounding, the execution of the seventh trump. And you will find all those things explained in the prophets and Quite frankly, to save you some time, the prophet Joel or Acts chapter 2 where Peter gave a sample on Pentecost Day of what this prophecy would be. That that is spoken of by Joel the prophet. Both sons and daughters shall testify against the locust army, the army of God that he sends to weed out those that claim to be Christians but never pick up the word of God. Biblically illiterate. Hey, it's about showtime, friend. The trumpet is sounding. It is a time of teaching. Many people, the real truth upsets them, but the truth does set you free from all these deceptions, devices. And uh, one that teaches boldly will take some bitterness. But that's fine. Look what you gain if you gain one soul from the deception and the very uh, uh, sleight of hand that Satan uses to deceive the biblically illiterate. Biblically illiterate because the sh false shepherds haven't taught them blowing off hot air about some church system rather than teaching God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Now, you might say, well, you probably are the most un 
popular pastor among other pastors that ever walked the earth. Well, no, I'm not. I'm really not. I can think of a lot of them. Peter and there, was a, there were a lot of the disciples and so forth, and I'm certainly not comparing myself to one of them. I'm saying it's not popular to teach the truth and try to save the lambs, the sheep, from Satan's fire, from his lies, from his deception, because his slippery chute is vaseline from many pulpits. You can wear that however it feels best, my friends. Chapter 11, I'm just out here winning friends and influencing people. Now, the seventh trump, verse 15. And the seventh trump sounded, action! This is it, friend. And there was great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world. What world? This world. Well, it's already got a prince. The prince of this world is Satan. Sorry, Charlie. This is the seventh trump. This is when it happens. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. And He shall reign forever and ever. And it shall not happen until the seventh trump, my friend. Don't ever, ever. Let any man deceive you in that regard. And the four and twenty elders which sat before um, God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God. Why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't you? Saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast art to come. In other words, he wast in the first earth age, he wast until he was crucified, and he is to come here at this seventh trump. And don't let anyone change that order for you. That's what God's Word states. Because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned, and the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, and they should be judged, uh, that they should be judged, and that they should give reward. Hey, friend, I look forward to Judgment Day because I look forward to rewards unto the servants of the prophets and the saints and them that fear thy name. Respect it, revere it, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the testum and the temple of God was opened in heaven. You want to take a peek? Do. It's free. Let's look in. The temple of heaven open, and there was seen there was what? There was seen in his temple the Ark of the Testament. That's to say the Ark of the Covenant. Well, I wonder where the Ark of the Covenant is. Do you want me to read it to you again? And the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in his temple the Ark of his Covenant. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquake and great hail. Seventh trump. Satan put totally out of business, but he lets you know why. Man couldn't handle the Ark of the Covenant, and you get these people that say, I want to go out and find the Ark of the Covenant. It's the last days. Yeah, well, it's, sorry, friend. It, your last days are probably already over. <laughs> it's written. Why do men play games rather than get down to business and teach and study God's Word rather than traditions of men? So simple, so very, very simple. You see, that seventh trump sounded after the two witnesses died in the streets of Jerusalem and lay there three and a half days. So if you want to know wisdom, know this. When the two witnesses, after the appearance of the spurious Messiah, lie dead in the pata, it's an arena in the, arena in the Greek, Three and a half days, no, the seventh trump is going to sound, and you have been warned. All right, bless your hearts. You listen a moment, won't you please? Free introductory package. Say, this is something we would like to offer for a one-time gift to all the new folk that study with us. This introductory package gives you a monthly newsletter, which means each month you will receive a newsletter with a Bible study on it. Hey, raising funds? No way. We're not beggars. We're Bible teachers. That's what it consists of. A tape catalog that will give you all the topics that are covered. And the Mark of the Beast tape. 
What is this mark of the beast? Is it really on your forehead? No, Satan's considerably more intelligent than that. It's in your forehead, which is to say in your mind. Have you been deceived? This is a free offer to you, one time to each new student. Say, find out what's really happening and what the story is on the mark of the beast. All right, bless your hearts, there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, if we may, 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the Spirit moves and you have a question, share it, won't you? And you that listen by shortwave around the world at this time, it's always a pleasure to hear from you. Your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. If you've got a prayer request, he's your Father. Father, around the globe we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Touch, prosper, heal in Yahshua's precious name. Amen. All right, let's see what kind of questions we got. Barry from Minnesota. Joseph and Solomon married Egyptians. Did God allow this, or was it a forbidden marriage? Now, now you see, Barry, there, you just jumped to conclusions without doing your homework, son. Joseph did not marry an Egyptian by as far as race is concerned, which would have made it a forbidden marriage. Joseph married a daughter of On, the city of On, all right? Which, where, where was On located? Or you may know it by uh, Beth Shemesh, the house of the sun, all right? It's in lower Egypt, southern. Do you know what we call southern Egypt? It's ruled by the shepherd kings. Egyptians were not shepherds. They wouldn't have sheep. They wouldn't touch them like that, all right? So, no, he married one of the shepherd kings, and if you want to do a little further research, uh, research the history on the Hyksos by a qualified scholar, not some numb brain, all right, as to who they were. And uh, you'll find out that certainly it was a good marriage. Now, poor old Solomon, he wasn't too, he, rather than go to war, if he could marry the daughter of some king, it didn't matter where she was from. God wasn't all that happy about that. But also, uh, Solomon kind of paid for a bunch of that too, did he not? Okay, enough said. Um, I, might, I might say at the same time, this is kind of like a lot of people say, well, Moses married an Egyptian. No, he didn't. The lack of scholarship is just frightening. Uh, I live in Arkansas, so I'm an Arkansan, or as we say, some of us, Arkansas-er, all right? But really, I'm an Irishman. My ancestors came from Ireland, and before they came from Ireland, they came over the Caucasus Mountains, and we were called Caucasians, and we were of the ten tribes that went north and were were taken captive by the Assyrians, you know, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with my lineage as to where I live, and that's where Moses was in the land of the Kenites, and he took a wife of, of, um, of a, a priest of the Medians, and who was Medan? Genesis 25, by, by, um, by Abraham's second wife, Keturah. He was the son of Abraham, and that's who he married. I mean, just people just fall apart in their scholarship. And I, I'm not saying I'm perfect, but Lord only knows, I would hate to have to apologize to people as much as some should, all right, for being wrong. And, and I'm, I don't mind apology, ap apologizing, but I consider myself to be a teacher, at least, gifted from God. And if I had to spend half of my time apologizing for misleading people, then I don't think God would bless this ministry the way He does in, in uh, over 100 million t uh, homes and more than that around the world. Marion from California. Revelation 2.4, who is the first love they left? It's Messiah, Jesus Christ for the false Messiah. They just jump overboard for the first one that's coming to gather on his wagon and fly, and it's Satan, all right? At the sixth trump, they're not gonna wait till the seventh. 
because of what they've been taught. Lori from Florida. When someone marries and then remarries later on, whose spouse will they be in heaven? Now, Lori, haven't you ever heard in John the seven men that was married to this one woman and she did them all in? She was quite a girl, all right, quite a girl. But then they asked, well, which one of those is she going to be with in heaven? Well, she probably wouldn't have had any of the seven, you know, if they, if they um, kicked out that quick. But anyway, be that as it may, Jesus answered, you do not know of what you ask for. You, they are neither given nor taken in marriage in heaven. Naturally, God is our husband. Isha, our husband, all right, in heaven. Uh, Carlton from uh, Kentucky. I have a question. Who is Satan going to deceive when he comes to earth if all the Christian folks are already raptured out? Question. Now see, there's an example. See, he knows that he's going to be raptured out. And when old Satan shows up first and says, Dear little children, time is short and I've got your ticket here. I'm ready to punch it. Jump on board because we're going to rapture away. He's, you know what? Old Carlton's going to jump on board and away he'll go. All right? See, Carlton, I hate to tell you this, but he's already got you deceived. You see, that is the mark of the beast, is to not know the chronological order. The seal of the beast in the forehead rather than the seal of God is to be biblically illiterate of the chronological order of events of the trumpets. God's word is written to save our souls. Men's traditions will rob you if you keep listening to men's traditions. The choice is yours. Hey. Um, you know, when the rewards are passed out on Judgment Day, um, it's going to be an interesting time. But some of the priests of the Millennium Age are going to be rewarded with, um, um, if you think an old Marine sergeant with a swagger stick was something to behold, just stick around. They're all going to be rewarded with swagger sticks to teach discipline to people that will not listen to the Word of God but prefer the Word of men. It's going to be an interesting time, a beautiful time. Okay, Lorene from Wisconsin. Satan was a supernatural being. If so, was Cain a gibbon? That's a Hebrew word that means giant. Okay, If he wasn't, then why were all the other children of fallen angels geber? If he was a geber, then why are the um, Kenites, not Geber or giants. Well, it, how many years ago was that? Have you ever read the, the Sargon, the Magnificent? He was pretty good size, honey. Do your homework. Joe, you said something about a Greek word pertaining to pharmacy. I take medicine for epilepsy. I think I should continue to do so. Please explain. Thank you for teaching. Joe, I didn't say one word about anybody not taking their medicine. I simply said that the word saucer for K, for K in the Greek comes from, is where our word pharmacy comes from. Um, Luke was a medical doctor. He prescribed a lot of legal, I'll call it for modern terminology, drugs for people to partake because they're good and they're necessary. But the word sorcerer, the sorcerer used marijuana, uh, crack cocaine, uh, this is to say the herbs that all this came from, they gathered them in big sacks, all right? And they put people, a sorcerer is one that uses drugs to put people on trips or dreams. There's nothing new under the sun. In other words, a sorcerer was a fancy word for a pusher, and God hates them, all right? But you that are prescribed um, medicines, naturally you take them. I, I hope that, uh, I don't really understand how you jump to that conclusion, but be that as it may, certainly always take your doctor's advice if you spend the money to go to the doctor, necessarily if you have a second opinion and agree with it. Nick from California. Revelation 13.3, could the deadly wound be the falling apart of the USSR? No way. 
The falling apart of the one world system is the only deadly wound that will be given to it because the wound must be given to the entire group, not just a part. Uh, Freya from Florida. Is hell a state of mind or a place? It's a lake of fire. You can read of it in Revelation chapter 20, the last uh, few verses. Or if you really want to get a, a good description of what happens in the lake of fire, read Ezekiel chapter 28 beginning with verse 18. That's what's going to happen to Satan and all those that follow him. Literally. Uh, K from Mass, Massachusetts. What is the shortest verse in the Bible? It's uh, John chapter 11, verse 35, Jesus wept. Um, you know, it's real simple. All you got to do is take your Strong's Concordance and look up the word wept. You know, I, I mean, I think everybody knows what the shortest verse is. If you have trouble finding it, just look it up. That's the way you would find it. Look under the word wept, and there'll only be two words there. Yeshua wept. Okay, I'm out of time again. Hey, I love you all a bunch. Our Father's Word is bold. God teaches in a bold way from His Word. It is sad when people are deceived by not recognizing or having read what is written. For it wasn't written as a waste of time. And it wasn't written so that people could die. But it was written so that people could live, love, and come under the shadow of our Father. That's what it's written for. Don't let any preacher, teacher, man pull you away from the Word of God. Pay attention to it. Hey, know what's real important? Stay in His Word every day in it's a good day. Do you know why? Jesus, Yeshua, is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. You have been viewing the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you are interested in obtaining more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer includes the Mark of the Beast audio tape, a newsletter with a written Bible study, a complete audio tape catalog, and a list of reference materials available through Shepherd's Chapel. You may request our free introductory offer by telephone. Call 1-800-643-4645, 24 hours a day to request the offer. You may also request by writing Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. That's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us and serious Bible students around the world for our next in-depth Bible study, Monday through Friday at the same time. Thank you for watching and God bless you.